guys, and welcome to the Moms and Murder Podcast, a true crime podcast featuring myself, Mandy, and my dear friend, Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Hi, Mandy. How are you? You know what, Melissa? I'm doing pretty dang good. How are you? <laughs> oh, wow, wow, wow. I, um, I'm i doing pretty darn good. I'd like wow. to meet you there. Yeah, we're doing great. This is a good week, right? Not just a good week. Melissa, I just wanted to say I'm so proud of us because I feel like we have been really on top of our game the whole month of October. Why are you doing this I when know. we still need this to come out <laughs> in November and there's still a few days left? How dare you put I know, this hex I on know. us? No, I have such a good feeling about it. We've had such a great October. We have managed to have so many things going on, but we have oh my gosh, we've been ahead. We've gotten things done early. I'm getting ready to leave on a trip tomorrow. Everything's going to be great. And I'm super excited and happy that we have just killed it. Well, and if anything goes wrong, it's all on me. No. <laughs> you won't even be in town. <laughs> I won't be in town, I'm, but I'm I'll be very, accessible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Um, no, I think, yeah, I agree. Somehow things have gone okay this month. And, oh, gosh, I can't wait for people to check in next month to be like, how's your November going? Right. And it just be no, like, why would no we say November. that? I know. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I'm excited. It has been a good month. It's feeling so great. I know we talked about that last week. We've gotten a few suggestions, one of which was to move to Vancouver Island. I oh, think. well, that sounds lovely. But that's Canada. I looked and it was like 22 degrees. And I was like, oh. ma'am, that's close, not quite not the quite weather. Close yeah. Enough. yeah, we're not that good. We're like, okay, with cooler weather. Ireland yeah. was another one I heard today. I think they good get suggestions really cold there too. Yeah. That's what I think people are missing. We just want perfect temperatures. All the time. We don't want it yeah. to be too cold. <laughs> We're looking for utopia. Um, that's, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. Actually, I um, am going to visit my family in New York, as I said, and I so it's a hit or miss this time of year. It's either like super, right. super cold or it's like really nice. And I was looking at the weather forecast today and it looks like it's going to be really nice this time. So yeah, the temperatures nice. are like in the upper 30s at night, but in like the upper 60s during the day. So I am like oh, so looking weather. forward yeah, to that nice actual autumn weather because we don't really get I mean we get some in Florida but it's just not the same as being up north our dear friend Jillian she uh, I was emailing with her the other day she um, sent me pictures of her kids and Mandy I was so blown away that there were like fall leaves behind them yeah <laughs> like I was like, your kids are adorable, but oh my gosh, you guys have leaves that look like fall. <laughs> I was like, I've never seen this. This is amazing. Yeah. So yeah. I, what's it like, guys? What's it like? Right. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. So I'm definitely looking forward to uh, going on that trip and seeing my family and seeing some leaves, as you said. That's not something yeah, we get really to nice. really see here. Yeah. All right, so we will go ahead and get into the episode for this week. This is a wild, wild story and when I say there's just a lot going on, I really mean oh there's gosh. a lot going on. <laughs> so the honeymoon phase of a relationship, something we've all heard of, it's a time where new couples are usually very carefree. And this excitement of the blossoming romance kind of blinds people to pretty much everything else going on, or at least to any flaws within that person. Those early days that are spent getting to know your partner are really some of the most exciting times for people who are newly in love. Melissa, don't you remember those days? <laughs> <laughs> I do remember them. I thought you were going to say, are you still in the honeymoon phase? And I'm in like, I don't even know how to say it. I, I got to stop. I'm happy. I promise. No, I wouldn't ask if you were still in the honeymoon phase because oh God, no. the honeymoon phase only is thought to last from about six months to two years long. So if you were saying that you were still in the honeymoon phase, I would have some follow-up questions. <laughs> <laughs> With who? <laughs> yeah. So for Tom and Patricia Allenson, that blissful feeling of newlywed joy was brought to an abrupt end less than two months after their wedding when they found themselves at the East Point Police Department filing a report against Tom's own father. And this was because Patricia said that he had come to their house while she was mowing the lawn and proceeded to expose himself to her. A few days later, though, Tom's parents, Walter and Carolyn, were both dead, bringing to a head the long-standing family feud that had plagued the Allensons for years. Walter and Carolyn Allenson never aspired to be parents. He was a respected attorney, and she was a nurse for a doctor in East Point. And together, they just had this really wonderful, romantic love affair going on, and they had no desire to have children. 
When Carolyn did get pregnant, it threw a huge wrench into their lives, and there was some resentment when their son Tom came along. Walter had sky-high expectations for his son, and Tom was often left feeling like he couldn't live up to the standards and that he was never good enough. When Tom became an adult, he started working as a blacksmith and farrier and got married really young, and it was a marriage that quickly ended in divorce, much to his father Walter's disappointment. Tom later married a second time to a woman named Carolyn, and this marriage lasted for several years and produced two children. So since Tom's wife had the same name as his mom, everybody just called her Little Carolyn. No. <laughs> I feel like I straight up just wouldn't get married to a man who who had a mom with the same name as me. I don't know. <laughs> That's a tough one. I, uh, growing up, I was little Melissa and I had a cousin. Oh, no. <laughs> my step cousin was big Melissa. Yeah. Mandy, I have to tell, sorry, this is a total detour, but I have to tell you this thing and I've been waiting to save it for this part because I saw this word and I was like, oh, this is perfect. At the gym, do you know what someone started calling me the first time they saw me? I didn't ask for this or even ask to speak to this person. Do you know what my name is now every time this person sees me? Well, I know you don't like nicknames, so I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> Amazon. What? Like Amazonian woman, because I'm so tall. He That's called rude. me Amazon. I know. And you know what I said? Dot com. <laughs> and I hope that's not sexual because I <laughs> threw that out there as like my little way to get him back. And um, no. So anyway, now he sees me and says, hey, Amazon. And I say dot com. And I don't know oh how to get out goodness. of it. Oh, my gosh. I'm hoping that this is just a case of like a very socially inept older person are uh, they older that's exactly okay. it they are they are yeah not like too old to be able to learn new tricks right. and like <laughs> stop this but now it's like a thing and i'm like oh gosh here it comes here it comes. oh my gosh so back to the story so everybody was calling tom's wife little carolyn but things weren't so rosy with little carolyn either Tom kind of felt like she beat him down, and eventually it got to a point where he really just wanted out of the marriage, so he filed for divorce. Little Carolyn, however, did not want to get divorced. She was very resentful and downright mad that she was being left a single divorced mother. And this second divorce also really upset Tom's father, Walter. He had been able to move past Tom's first failed marriage, but now that there were children in the picture, Walter was angry that his son wanted to abandon his family. So this divorce drove a major wedge between Walter and Tom, to the point that Walter even testified on behalf of little Carolyn in court. The Allensons actually cut Tom out of their will and officially disowned him as their child. After his parents kicked him out, Tom had nowhere to go, so he started sleeping on the couch of Clifford and Marguerite Radcliffe, and that's when he first laid eyes on Patricia, the Radcliffe's daughter. Tom was instantly smitten when he saw Patricia for the first time. He was immediately attracted to her looks and her delicate nature. Patricia, who likes to be called Pat, was the image of a classic, old-fashioned Southern belle. She was absolutely obsessed with the movie Gone with the Wind, and she thought of herself as Scarlett O'Hara, and she tried to emulate the character in real life. Pat seems like a nice woman, and her parents were already being so kind to Tom and giving him a place to stay after his own parents had disowned him, and Tom really needed all the support he was getting from the Radcliffs, so it was natural that he leaned into his attraction to Pat. And the feelings really were mutual, too. Pat thought that Tom was handsome, he was tall, hardworking, and a total gentleman who came from a family with old money. He was just what Pat was looking for, the Rhett Butler to her Scarlett O'Hara. Since Tom was crashing on her parents' sofa, she was aware of the animosity in his family, but she thought Walter and Carolyn would eventually come around and would accept their relationship one day. As we said, Walter was straight up angry with his son Tom that he divorced the mother of his children a.k.a. Little Carolyn, which I want to call her Little Carolyn, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> so while they waited for Tom and Little Carolyn's divorce to be finalized, Pat and Tom moved about an hour away to a plantation in Zebulon. The divorce was final on May 9th, 1974, and Tom married Pat that same day. Whoa. Yeah, that is that is wasting no time. And Pat wore a hoop skirt and carried a delicate fan while Tom dressed in a top hat and a swallowtail coat. 
Pat even had Tom wear a fake mustache <laughs> so he would look more like Rhett Butler. <laughs> was he told of this the day of? Like, I'm going to need a mustache on you? I or know, because like, he could have grown one, right? Couldn't he have grown one out? I guess. But if they're like divorce, marry the same day, they're not <laughs> wasting any time, I guess. So as you may have guessed, none of this really pleased Tom's father, Walter Allenson. The tensions only really grew in the weeks following Pat and Tom's wedding, and the hostility became a serious problem for Pat. The elder Allensons simply refused to accept Pat or to include her in any family activities, which completely enraged her. Pat was used to being the center of attention and being adored by everyone she met, and it really bothered her deeply that Tom's parents weren't fawning all over her. Plus, without their acceptance, Pat would never have any chance of getting her hands on the family money. So Pat wasn't born into a fortunate circumstance herself. Her mother, Marguerite, was only 15 years old when she gave birth to Pat, and the identity of her father is unknown, but it's thought that he was a married man named Cam Pigeon. Pat was raised by her grandmother, who she called Mama Siler, for the first several years of her life. When Pat's mom was 17, she gave birth to another baby, a boy that she named Kent. And Kent is believed to have the same father as Pat, but Marguerite actually left that part of his birth certificate blank, so technically it is not known for sure. When Pat was five, she went back to live with Marguerite and with her new husband, Clifford Radcliffe. Clifford was in the army and took care of Marguerite and the kids, raising Pat and Kent as if they were his own children. From that point on, Pat was pretty spoiled. She was showered with gifts and attention, and her mom admitted that she always had a really hard time disciplining Pat because she was just too dang pretty. I have never heard that as an excuse <laughs> to not discipline your child. That's wild. I mean, we all think our children are beautiful. And of course, you know, when my of boys course. were younger, and I think this is mostly a problem that people have when their kids are younger, like toddlers, and you're like, oh, you're just so cute. It's so hard to get onto yeah. you. But even then, it's like, come on, you know, you have to... You have to discipline your child. You have they have to have Too some pretty? boundaries. Yeah, that's it's it's just setting them up for I feel like a lot of problems down the road because that's not how life works. Wait so, your wrinkles. It's gonna get way yeah. worse. <laughs> so as Pat got older, she learned how to manipulate people with her charming and sweet personality. And she pretended to be this helpless and dainty little girl. When she was just 14, Pat started dating an 18-year-old named Gil Taylor. Gil was in the army, and before long, Pat was pregnant with his baby. Just like her mom, she was 15 when she gave birth to her first child, Susan. And she and Gil went on to have two more kids, who they named Debbie and Ronnie. When Pat's kids were growing up, it was obvious to them that she was completely desperate for attention. Susan later recalled a time when she actually watched Pat beating herself with pots and pans, and Susan really could not figure out what her mom was doing until several hours later when Pat called the police and told them that she had been attacked. Whoa. Yeah. So pretty early on, Susan figured out that something was just off about her mom, but because that was her mom, she really didn't want to spend too much time dwelling on it. When Susan got married in 1971, Pat's overwhelming desire to be the center of attention led her to standing up at the reception and announcing that she was filing for divorce from her husband, Gil. <laughs> this is at her daughter's wedding. Yeah. So she and Gil had been married for 19 years at this time. And just a few hours earlier, they had posed for these happy family photos with the bride and groom. So nobody was more shocked by this whole scene than Gil himself, who had no idea that Pat wanted to get a divorce at all. And obviously nobody expected her to crash her own daughter's wedding like that. So after initiating the divorce process, Pat moved back in with her parents and began dating numerous men, but none really seemed to fit the bill for her. That is until Tom Allenson started living with her parents and a romance blossomed between the two. Now, as we said before, Pat was very aware of the drama between Tom and his parents, Walter and Carolyn, but she thought they would eventually grow to accept her. But she was wrong. In the early days of their relationship and soon after their wedding, Pat prodded Tom to make things right with his father. Tom tried to explain to her what his relationship with his family was like and that his father did not want to see him, but Pat insisted that Tom needed to get back into Walter and Carolyn's good graces. But then, on June 28th, the friction between Tom and his parents came to a boiling point. 
Pat told Tom that while she was outside mowing the lawn, Walter came over and exposed himself to her, and she demanded that Tom do something about it to protect her honor. At around 9.15 the very next day, Walter and Carolyn were shot at nine times while driving near their boathouse on Lake Lanier, which Lake Lanier, every story I ever hear about Lake Lanier is like, and then somebody died, and then somebody oh, died. Oh, I have never heard mystery. of that place, like, and I oh, don't want to know more. That's creepy. Yeah. So neither of the Allensons were actually hit by any bullets, but they did have some cuts from the flying glass. It was determined that whoever shot at them had cut some tree limbs in a nearby area to hide themselves while shooting. So this was very much an ambush. No one was ever held responsible for the shooting, but Tom was the prime suspect after Walter told officers that he and his son had a quote unquote little trouble in the past. Authorities actually found two witnesses that said they saw Tom's truck nearby before and after the shooting took place. And a couple of days later, on July 1st, Tom called his father and they spoke for a little while. We're not sure exactly what was said in this conversation, but it left Walter, quote, visibly upset, end quote. Walter actually went out and purchased a rifle and borrowed a pistol after this call from Tom. Later that same day, Tom and Pat went down to the police station to report that Walter had exposed himself to Pat and they asked police to charge Walter with public indecency and making threatening phone calls. Tom actually made a comment to Sergeant Charles Butts that if, quote, this kind of stuff kept up, he was going to kill his father, end quote. The East Point police looked into the claims of indecent exposure, but found multiple witnesses that said Walter was at his law office the entire day that Pat said this actually happened. So I don't understand Pat's angle with this, because if it if she made this up, what was the point? She was trying to get in their good graces so that she would have access to the family money. But then why would you go and accuse your father-in-law of something like that, knowing? Yeah, you can't recover from that. No, no. So obviously it goes without saying that tensions were at an extremely high level at this point in time. And things really were about to get so much worse. On the evening of July 3rd, at about 8 p.m., Tom's ex-wife, little Carolyn, called the police to say that a burglar was in the Allenson home and that big Carolyn, older Carolyn, had been shot. Little Carolyn said that Walter was down in the basement holding this burglar hostage at gunpoint down there. Officers had actually already just been to the Allenson home to check things out because Walter had gotten this strange phone call from an unidentified woman informing him that his son Tom was on the way to his house and that he was looking for trouble. So Walter left his office and went home. Carolyn, little Carolyn, and the grandkids arrived a short time later. Walter went through the house to make sure Tom wasn't there, and there wasn't really much else that the officer that came by could do, so he left. And Walter told the officer that if Tom did show up, he was going to shoot him. And I don't know what things were like back when this story took place, but why are all these people telling police officers that they're going to shoot someone? Yeah, just like openly, they're like, you can actually put that on the record. I don't even care. If I see this person, I'm going to shoot them. Like, that's (laughs) twice now that somebody has said that to a police officer. And that just seems so wild to me. So it was only about a half an hour later that little Carolyn was calling to report that a shooting actually had taken place in the house. Officers rushed to the home to find that both of the elder Allensons, Walter and Carolyn, had been shot. Little Carolyn was hysterically crying on the driveway when authorities arrived, and she explained what happened as best as she could. She said things were chaotic. Walter was yelling at her to get the kids out of the house and telling Carolyn to bring a gun down to the basement where he had Tom cornered. Carolyn grabbed the rifle and started heading down the stairs, telling little Carolyn on the way that if she saw Tom, she would kill him. The next thing little Carolyn heard was a male voice telling Carolyn to shut up, and she heard Carolyn say, Tommy, 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 before Carolyn was shot to death on the stairs. Walter yelled for little Carolyn to get out of the house, so she ran, and on her way out, she heard five or six more shots that sounded like a pop gun, and then she heard one final blast. And we have so much more to get into with this story after a quick break to hear a word from this week's sponsors. I don't wear shapewear too often, but when I do, I hate it. That was until Honey Love. Honey Love has spent years researching and developing shapewear that's actually comfortable. 
No longer do we need to feel like a can of squished biscuits when all we want to do is look cute in our new dress. And that's because Honey Love was made with comfort in mind. Honey Love is in its own league when it comes to shapewear. Take their Superpower short, for example. It actually has targeted compression technology that actually distinguishes between the areas you want more support and need less compression. And their signature X helps sculpt your midsection without squeezing against natural curves, allowing it to work with your body, not against it. I took my Honey Love out for its maiden voyage a few weeks ago during our short-lived cold spell. I wore the Superpower short with jeans and a sweater. Now, I'm a child of the 80s, so I'm very accustomed to just putting a spaghetti strap under every shirt I wear. But I skipped it this day, and I just wore the Honey Love with my sweater and jeans. And let me tell you, it felt and looked great. Honey Love doesn't roll down, which is an actual miracle in the world of shapewear. Plus, I wasn't pulling on my sweater, which is what I'm always doing when I'm wearing a little spaghetti strap top underneath. Instead, I felt confident and, dare I say, even a little cute. No matter the occasion, you deserve to look and feel your absolute best. Get 20% off at honeylove.com with the code MOMS. Calling all my honeys. You deserve this. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. Wouldn't it be great if life came with an owner's manual? Imagine having problems pop up and skimming the index at the back of the manual for things like feeling like I can't do anything right. Oh yeah, that's on page 3,578. Let me see what I need to do now. And while people don't come with manuals, luckily therapists are trained to actually help you find the cause of those challenging emotions and actually learn productive coping skills, which makes therapy really the closest thing to your own personal owner's manual. BetterHelp is a great tool to help you in being the best you possible. Whether you're looking to work through long-term problems, right now problems, or ways to take on problems when they arise, your BetterHelp therapist is available on the phone, on video, or even through chat to help you work through things. Sometimes the hardest part is just starting. For me, my journey with therapy has been more than a decade, and it's something that's benefited me extensively throughout the years. I'm not the same person I was when I started therapy, and that's a good thing. As the world's largest therapy service, BetterHelp has matched 3 million people with professionally licensed and vetted therapists available 100% online. Plus, it's affordable. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to match with a therapist. If things aren't clicking, you can easily switch to a new therapist anytime. It couldn't be simpler. No waiting rooms, no traffic, no endless searching for the right therapist. Learn more and save 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com slash moms. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash moms. Now back to the episode. So before the break, we were talking about the murders of Walter and Carolyn Allenson in their home. And so officers make their way into the basement of the home and they find their bodies, but there is no sign of their son, Tom, anywhere. So it appeared that Carolyn, the mom, had been shot while standing on the fourth step. She was shot in the chest with a shotgun from about 10 feet away, causing her to fall backwards on the steps where she died instantly. Walter had been shot in the face and stomach from about 15 feet away with the shotgun. Investigators found the rifle that Carolyn was carrying down the stairs in the basement, along with the pistol that Walter had taken with him, but the shotgun that was used to shoot the Allensons wasn't there, but it was later found in the bushes in the front yard. None of the weapons had any fingerprints on them. The feud between Walter and Tom was somewhat of an open secret, so it was pretty much instantly determined that Tom was the prime suspect in the murders. And oh yeah, he's been telling everyone he would kill his dad if he saw him. So three witnesses claimed that they saw Tom running near the Allenson home right before officers arrived and found the bodies, which made officers even more desperate to locate Tom. Two of these witnesses were the Allenson's neighbors, and the other was an East Point patrolman who saw Tom running and clutching his right side shortly before police were called about the shooting. Tom looked suspicious, and this patrolman actually wanted to apprehend him, but then he got a call that someone at the Allenton house had been shot and that a burglar was holding a hostage. Can you imagine, like, he's literally seeing Tom, who may have been involved in this crime, and is like, I kind of want to talk to this guy, but then you get a call to go to the place where he actually may have been. Right. So a nationwide bulletin with Tom's information on it was sent out, and officers started looking for Tom and for Pat, who turned out to be pretty easy to find. Pat was sitting in her Jeep in a parking lot just a few blocks away when an officer found her. 
She claimed she was in the area for a doctor's appointment that afternoon, but officers were obviously suspicious of this because it was after 8 p.m. and she wasn't even parked near a doctor's office. In fact, she was halfway between the doctor's office and the Allenson home. So Pat was taken in for further questioning where she elaborated on her story. Pat said that Tom had dropped her off at her appointment and then he left on foot to go to the bank and left the Jeep with her, but Tom never came back. Pat said she waited for hours and she started getting nervous, thinking something may have happened to Tom, like maybe he got ran over. So she started calling hospitals. How long are you going to sit there before you start calling places? Yeah, and how far was the bank? I would have just gotten my car and just drove that route that he would have walked and looked, you know, because that would have been my first thought. But she just kind of sat there and called hospitals, I guess, instead. Yeah, but like hours? You wait hours? Yeah, that seems like a long a time. Lot. Yeah. So when she learned that he hadn't been admitted to any of these hospitals, she said she didn't know what to do. And so officers tell Pat that they need to find Tom because they suspected that he had just murdered his parents. Pat acts shocked, and she acted like she had no idea why he would do such a thing. She just simply couldn't believe it. She told the officers how Walter had come to their house and exposed himself to her, and then Walter allegedly called Pat's mother and told her to tell Tom that he was going to kill him. Like you were saying, I've never heard this many people (laughs) threatening stuff just willy-nilly out in the world. So as this interview with Pat went on, investigators kept pressing her for more information. Surely she knew something about why Tom, her husband, would kill his parents, And the more they questioned her, the more she did start to come around to the idea that Tom could have done this. She told them, quote, I have no choice but to think somehow, in some way, for some reason or another, he either saw them and they said, let's talk or something, and he went up there. They might have been trying to kill Tom for all I know. That, to me, is the most likely thing. And if somebody tried to hurt him, he might have tried to hurt them in return, end quote. When investigators started asking Pat for more information about her doctor's appointment, she conveniently fainted. An ambulance was called, but they found nothing wrong with her. That reminds me of an episode of King of Queens where he can't remember his wife's boss's name and he like fakes having a heart attack. Like he and he's like looks at her and he's like, Look, aren't you proud of me? She's like, What is wrong with you? It's such a wild thing to do though. Yeah. So while Pat was being questioned, other officers continued to look for Tom. And finally, at about 1 a.m., police got a tip that he was at his home in Zebulon. So officers were able to go there and arrest him without any incident. On the way to the station, officers reminded Tom that he was being arrested for the murder of his parents, to which he responded, quote, that's about as ridiculous as it can be. He claimed that he never went to his parents' house at all because his father told him that he would shoot him on sight if he showed up, and Tom said he believed his dad really would do that. They also asked him why he left Pat in East Point and never went back to where she was waiting for him. And he said that it was because they had actually gotten into an argument. And so he decided to hitchhike home. When officers brought Tom into the station and Pat saw him, she said, tell me you didn't do what they said you did. And Tom paused for a moment and then said, I didn't do it. Investigators absolutely did not believe Tom and Pat. But they didn't have enough to keep Pat in custody, so she was released and went back home while Tom was taken to jail. Investigators were really never able to gather enough evidence pointing to Pat's potential involvement, so they moved forward with preparing a case just against Tom. His attorneys tried to get him to plead guilty to the lesser charge of manslaughter, but for whatever reason, Pat insisted that Tom not do that. She attended every meeting Tom had with his lawyers and also helped plan his defense. Tom believed that Pat was in his corner and was on his side fighting for him. But that wasn't exactly the case. Some recorded tapes were later found from Pat's visits to Tom in jail. Uh, She had recorded some of their calls and some of the times that they had in-person visits. And she accidentally gave these tapes to her daughter, Susan, who listened to them. How do you accidentally do that? Uh, Susan said that the tapes were given to her and there was a bunch of like country and Western music tapes, you know, just like different cassettes tapes this was during the time of cassette tapes and so these um calls and things were recorded onto a regular cassette tape and so i guess pat didn't realize or had forgotten that she recorded onto these tapes and she gave a bunch of tapes to susan and so you know susan thinks that she's gonna hear 
I don't know Reba. what the yeah exactly Reba's at the time hits. right and instead she is listening to these recorded calls and stuff that her mom <gasps> has um, previously made and wow. she yeah and so she said that these tapes were actually very revealing and very disturbing so in one tape there was a conversation where Pat was telling Tom that she had brought poison to the jail and wanted him to take it she actually said quote the only way we can be together is if we're both dead. You take it, and I'll go out in the parking lot and take it, and we'll meet on the other side. And Tom did not take her up on this. What a wild thing to do. Take it yeah. now, lady. I'll, I'll take it after you. Yeah, and you know that she had no intention of taking anything. No, but if she could sneak it in, why wouldn't they both take it at the same time? That doesn't make any sense. Why right? would you wait to go out in the parking lot? Not believing you, Pat. So in the fall of 1974, Tom went to trial for the first-degree murder of his parents. Prosecutors said that Tom was the only person who had a motive. He was upset his parents had disowned him and that they wouldn't accept his new wife, Pat. They were permitted to introduce evidence on the June 29th shooting ambush a few days before the murders, and they said that Tom was responsible for that as well. For Tom's defense, though, they said he had nothing to do with the murders at all, and he wasn't even at the house. He was actually at his grandmother's house, which happens to be next to the Allenson house. The defense said there was no evidence that Tom was actually in his parents' house and that any evidence they had was purely circumstantial. There were no fingerprints or hair on the murder weapons in the basement, and no blood was found on Tom when he was arrested. So according to the defense, the prosecution's case was, quote, nothing but supposition, innuendo, hypothesis, conjecture, and suspicion, end quote. I actually really like that line a lot. And yeah. if I was an attorney, day one, that would be my favorite line. So according to the Atlanta Constitution, Tom and Pat, quote, often chatted head to head during the trial and embraced during recesses. They were allowed to eat lunch together at the defense table during the lunch break, which is highly unusual, end quote. Pat was actually seen making faces at the jury, kind of overreacting, and she often fainted in the hallway. <laughs> Ma'am, get a Snickers. I watched like a little documentary show about this a long time uh -huh. ago because um, we have had this case on our list for quite some time. So there was a while ago that I had watched like a little documentary thing and I forgot that I had already seen it and had already, you know, it kind of jogged my memory. Yeah, yeah. But what they were saying about Pat in that documentary, they described her as just being very like over the top, but kind of fake about how fragile she was and how she was just right. this like really really demure and like dainty southern belle very like just needed other people to take care of her nonstop, and like she really just put on this act and so i just picture her like doing all these fainting spells and being so dramatic about it and like yeah. i don't know if that's how it really was but like that's the image that i got from some it of the stuff seems that i like watched. it yeah if someone's fainting multiple times and nothing's wrong with them, like nothing medically <laughs> is wrong with them, there's a lot of show being put on here. For sure. So it was later learned that Pat completely undermined Tom's defense. She sat at the defense table as if she was one of the attorneys herself, which is wild. I've never seen that. She wasn't a co-defendant. Why on earth was she sitting there? Tom's real attorney even tried to have Pat barred from the courtroom, but the judge wouldn't allow it. But at least make her move. That's just wild. So the key witness for the defense was a liquor store employee named Kendall, who said Tom couldn't have been at his parents' house when they were killed because he was at the liquor store two miles away at 7.48 p.m. And Kendall said he looked at his watch, so he was sure of the time. And he remembered Tom because he asked for change to make a long-distance call. However, during cross-examination, Kendall admitted that he was farsighted and he needed glasses, which he was not wearing when this Tom had come into the store. He also admitted to refusing to make a written statement to police and that he accused the police of harassment after being questioned eight times. Officers said he was questioned so much because his first two interviews weren't very convincing and he wavered in his recollection of the story. That's a weird, like, I know people say, like, I don't know about you, but I think we've talked about this before. If I hear a crazy noise, I'll like look at my watch and I'm like, all right, it is 8.48 right. and I heard a loud boom. Let's see what happens on the news tonight. And I just don't see like just a random person coming in the liquor store and you looking at your watch and, and like that to me isn't so memorable that you would remember the time days later after you're being yeah. questioned. I can't imagine it was the same time. 
So back to the story. Pat's mom, Marguerite, testified for the defense that Pat called her on the night of the murders at about 7.25 p.m. and said that Tom had taken off on foot to go talk to his grandmother, who again lived next door to the Allensons. In an attempt to prove that Tom was not the shooter that shot into his parents' car on June 29th, the defense brought in a Barnesville gas station employee who said that Tom and Pat stopped for gas at the station where he worked between 10.15 and 10.30 that morning. And so this gas station is about 100 miles away from Lake Lanier, nearly two hours of driving time. So there would be no way for Tom to have been there to shoot them at 9.15 a.m. But on October 18th, after deliberating for just over two hours, the jury found Tom guilty on two counts of murder. He was sentenced to concurrent life terms. As he was being led out of the courtroom, Pat said, Tom, I love you. After Tom was put behind bars, Pat became close with his grandparents, who are known as Paul and Nona Allenson. Unlike Tom's parents, his grandparents had not disowned him. They were both very elderly, and Nona had suffered several strokes that left her unable to fully care for herself, so Paul was doing a lot of the caregiving while he himself was also very aged. They had a daughter named Jean who came over and helped when she could, but their relationship with Jean actually kind of took a little decline after Tom's trial because Paul and Nona fully supported Tom, and they didn't believe that he shot his parents. Jean eventually stopped going over there to help them, and as a result, Pat took on the responsibility. But it wasn't long before both Paul and Nona were dead. It was early in 1976 when Paul suffered a heart attack, which rendered him unable to care for Nona the same way he had been. And so as a result of this, Pat became even more responsible for their care, to the point that she was pretty much their full-time caregiver. So because of that, Pat eventually broached the subject of becoming Paul and Nona's power of attorney, and then she helped them change their wills. But with every change, Pat was, of course, giving herself more power within their estate, which was worth, at the time, the equivalent of $600,000 to about a million dollars today. The fourth and final revision to the will was written in February of 1976. Paul and Nona named Tom as the executor of their estate and named Pat the co-executor. What Paul and Nona probably didn't know was that Tom would never be able to control the estate because he was in prison. So by default, their entire estate was in the hands of Pat. And since Pat was also the power of attorney, she was able to access funds from the estate even before Paul and Nona wow. died. Yeah. This is the type of like elderly um, I know you're already mad. that yeah, I'm already like fuming. Okay. Like this is the type of <laughs> like taking advantage of the elderly because this specific type of thing is so – there's not a lot known about it and there's not a lot, lot of laws specifically dealing with this type of thing and right. how do you prove it and, like, what do you do? Um, and it's very hard to prove in a lot of cases because a lot of times the elderly person will appear to be of sound mind enough to sign these documents, but the person – you know, that they're going to the notary or the attorney, they don't know the full story. You know, they only see the person in front of them that day that's in their office saying, Hey, I want to make these changes to my will. But, and then who's to say, you know, that a family member later isn't going to show up and be like, why would you allow them to do that? You know, like that was, you know, now this person is in control of their finances, but it's like, it's so hard in these situations because it's very sticky to find out, you know, who is actually allowed to do these things and who isn't, and was it like a good choice to let them do it? Very, very tough topic. So at the time that the changes were made to the will, Paul and Nona's attorney did feel that the couple was okay and of sound mind to make these decisions. They didn't know that Pat was secretly scheming to have control of all their money. And as if this wasn't bad enough, Pat did something else that was completely despicable in April of 1976. She took Pa to a bank so they could get some documents notarized. And Pat had the documents in a pile that she flipped through for Pa to sign, and then the teller would stamp it. But no one realized that one of the pages was completely blank except for this spot where Pa was to sign and a notary would stamp the page at the bottom. Pat then takes this blank, notarized piece of paper, stuck it in the typewriter, and typed out a five-page confession where Pa was claiming responsibility for killing Walter and Carolyn. Oh, the letter said that Tom, his grandson, was innocent. (laughs) This is diabolical. Can you imagine? Absolutely unhinged, insane. This is one of the craziest things I've ever heard of somebody going to this length. Absolutely. So you're, I mean, you're, it's just the worst of the worst for sure. 
So the letter detailed how Tom had been in the basement when the shots were fired, but he was somehow miraculously unhurt. And Pat then puts a letter into a sealed envelope and she gives it to the attorneys that drew up Pa and Nona's wills. But this envelope has a note on the outside that says, do not open until I pass. So the attorneys didn't open the envelope until a couple months later in June when they got word that Pa was unconscious in the hospital clinging to life. Pat had called the family doctor on June 13th because she allegedly could not wake up 79-year-old Pa. The doctor arrives to find Pa in a comatose state. And Pat said that he had been drinking whiskey and taking medications, and she gave the doctor an empty bottle with no label on it that Pa allegedly was drinking from. So when Pa's attorneys found out he was in a coma, they opened the letter and read the forged confession. They did not give the confession to authorities. Meanwhile, Pa was being treated as an overdose patient, but his daughter, Jean, was not convinced that her dad was sick because of alcohol. She said he didn't even drink whiskey, and he only took his medication reluctantly. So she asked doctors to test him for poisoning, which is so smart. If they weren't coming up with this on their own for her to be like, this isn't right, I want you to do more testing. So 15 days later, the results were in. Pa had nearly lethal levels of arsenic in his system consistent with chronic poisoning over a period of time. In light of this new development, authorities hospitalized Nona out of caution and worry that she too had been poisoned. And so Pat finds out that Nona's going to be checked in and she tries to object and stop this whole thing from happening. Nona was eventually determined to have dangerously high levels of arsenic in her system as well. And when Jean found out that her parents had been poisoned, she contacted the prosecutor who prosecuted Tom for the murder of his parents. And somehow we still have more to get into. And still we'll get so into much it more. <laughs> <laughs> after one last break to hear word from this week's sponsors. You know that one weird wall in your house with nothing on it and you really can't figure out what to do with it? Yeah, me too. Thankfully for me and for you, canvasprints.com has the answer. Canvasprints.com allows you to create quality canvas prints at truly affordable prices, and it's honestly so easy to use. You literally just upload a photo from the same phone you're listening to us on, and you can create beautiful, beautiful prints. One thing I had done were these three photos that I had printed from Etsy onto canvas prints. And since I wanted to hang them all together on canvasprints.com, I was actually able to look at different wall displays of curated canvas sizes so I could see exactly what it would look like on my wall. Canvasprints.com can even help you with your holiday shopping. If you're looking for the perfect customized gift for someone in your life, you want canvasprints.com. Take that one photo in your phone of your family actually all smiling at the same time and put it on a mug or a mouse pad or take a sonogram picture and turn it into a photo puzzle for the new grandparents. The only thing you can't do is put an unflattering picture of your sister onto coasters because that's sort of my thing. Shipping was so fast when I ordered these sister coasters and I already received them and gave them to her as an early Christmas gift. Right now, canvasprints.com has a special offer just for our listeners. Go to canvasprints.com and use code MOMS25 to get 25% off your entire order of canvas prints, canvas wall displays, metal prints, photo tiles, photo blankets and pillows, and much more. Why not start and finish your holiday shopping early with this amazing offer? That's canvasprints.com and use code MOMS25 for 25% off your entire order. With one of the best savings rates in America, banking with Capital One is the easiest decision in the history of decisions, even easier than deciding to listen to another episode of your favorite podcast. And with no fees or minimums on checking and savings accounts, is it even a decision? Get started today. It only takes about five minutes to open an account with Capital One, and there's no minimum to open and keep your account. That's banking reimagined. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com slash bank. Capital One NA member FDIC. It's been a while since I've had a baby of my own, and some days I miss it so much. The baby cuddles and baby smiles, but when it comes to diaper rashes, not so much. I remember the first time my oldest had a diaper rash, I was really devastated. Here's this tiny thing totally dependent on me, and now she's fussy and obviously uncomfortable, and I'm supposed to have the answers. Well, with time and treatment, it went away, but what I really wanted was to avoid it altogether. And now, baby butts rejoice. 
New Huggies Skin Essentials are here, a brand new dermatologist-approved line of diapers, wipes, and pull-ups training pants, all designed with baby's sensitive skin in mind. The wipes are thick and have zero harsh ingredients for a great, gentle clean. Pull-Up Skin Essentials has got your big kid covered, too, with a training pant that's ultra-soft and breathable to help protect sensitive skin throughout potty training. Whether you're a first-time parent or a seasoned pro, make it easy on yourself and your baby with Huggies. Learn more at Huggies.com. Once again, head to Huggies.com to learn more. Hey, guys. As you know, I'm someone who loves knowing a little about everything. I love the news. I love entertainment. I love it all. But sometimes I don't have enough time to get all the information, all the little details, and the minutia of everyday news because, my goodness, it's constantly going. But thanks to the Newsworthy podcast, I can get all I need in little bite-sized pieces. So if the stress of the news is getting you down but you still want to know what's going on in things like the election, check out the Newsworthy. And in these 10-minute episodes, they're just on-the-go listening. I can listen to it quickly on a walk, on my way bringing my kids to or from school or one of their activities. When I'm in line at the grocery store, there's never a wrong time to listen to the newsworthy. But if you feel bogged down by the news and kind of the negativity of it, but you still want to be informed on what's going on, the newsworthy is the place to do it. Erica at the newsworthy is an independent journalist and her team does really all the hard work and research for you. I love that the episodes are so well rounded and there will be fun stuff like tech or big stories. But the way Erica gives this, you know, efficient and neutral overview of the news and in just 10 minutes each weekday, it's it's, it's perfect. Just search The Newsworthy in your podcast app or go to thenewsworthy.com to start listening. Again, search for the podcast The Newsworthy, two words, The Newsworthy, to make staying informed easier and more enjoyable every weekday. And now back to the episode. So before the break, we have already covered so, so much. We've talked about the murder of Walter and Carolyn Allenson and how their son Tom has been convicted of that murder. And now we're kind of finding, we're digging deeper into the story and finding out more about Tom's wife, Pat Allenson, who has a little bit of a history and maybe a little bit of a dark side herself. She's now been caught poisoning Tom's grandparents, who she for some reason, was taken care of after he went to prison. Um, And so after Paul and Nona's attorneys found out that there was poisoning involved in this, they turned the confession letter over to the police. The confession letter that, of course, was not real. This was the one that Pat had forged and had a notarized piece of paper. Just crazy banana stuff. So right away, when the investigators see this letter, they knew that Paul didn't write it. For one thing... The letter was dated April 19th, but the notary stamp was for April 16th. So it was immediately suspicious that these dates didn't match because why would something be notarized before it was even written? Pat told officers that Paul had actually dictated this letter to her as she typed it out, but she didn't have an explanation for why it was notarized prior to being written. Isn't that just a dumb Pat mistake? Why didn't yeah. she just date the same it's thing? Like, definitely that's just all a dumb had Pat to do. mistake. Yeah, she wow. definitely just wasn't thinking that the notary stamp had a date on it or she didn't look or she was just in her haste, wanted to type this letter out a few days later, put the wrong date on it. I mean, good. It. I'm glad. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, crazy. So Paul actually started to recover from his poisoning and investigators were able to speak with him a lot more regarding this letter. And they confirmed what they already thought that Paul was innocent and had nothing to do with the murder of his son and daughter-in-law. Paul then signed an affidavit for the DA's office, officially claiming that the letter was quote, procured through deceitful and fraudulent means end quote. Pat was arrested on August 6th and charged with two counts of attempted murder. Less than a year later, on May 2nd, a jury was selected for her trial. The prosecution actually had a pretty weak and circumstantial case, so they sought out just to prove three things. One, Pat had access to Tom's grandparents. Two, she had the ability to poison them. And three, she had a motive for doing so. They claimed that Pat had slowly poisoned the elderly couple while taking over their estate and gaining control over their finances. And they said it was Pat who drafted the false confession letter and tried to frame Paul for murder. Then, when Pat thought she had everything sorted out, she poisoned Paul one last time, hoping that it would kill him. In Pat's perfect plan, the police would read the fake confession after Paul's death, and they would just magically release Tom from prison, and they would go off and live happily ever after, $200,000 richer from the estate. Paul also testified that he didn't write the letter, 
And at this point, he was bound to a wheelchair due to the injuries that he suffered from this poisoning. Wow. The defense told the jury that they didn't know how Pa and Nona were poisoned, but they did know that Pat wasn't involved. They alleged that the poisonings could have been a pure accident. After all, Pa was old and losing his mind due to all the drinking and pill popping. This is all, of course, according to the defense. They said he'd even tried to smother his wife at one point before he went into a coma. The defense also suggested that Gene was just as much of a possible suspect as Pat. They tried to poke holes into the prosecution's theory by questioning why Pat would kill Pa and Nona when she already had access to their estate. Pat testified that she knew nothing about the arsenic and that Pa had confessed to the murder of Walter and Carolyn when he thought he was going to die of heart failure. Prosecutors countered by telling the jury about what a slow and awful way arsenic poisoning kills a person and that it's highly unlikely that anyone would take their own life that way. They said it takes a very cold person to sit by and watch their poisoning victims suffer for months on end. After eight hours of deliberation, the jury found Pat guilty of two counts of attempted murder, and she was sentenced to two consecutive life terms, the maximum sentence allowed. Tom filed for divorce within the first year of Pat going to prison for the murder of his grandparents. Pat later appealed his convictions and sentences, but the Court of Appeals of Georgia affirmed them both. A year and a half later, she filed a motion for a new trial based on newly discovered evidence. And if you're wondering what that new evidence was, it was that Pat was insane at the time of her first trial. In an appeal document, Pat's mother talked about many bizarre occurrences and a suicide attempt. She knew her daughter had mental problems, but said she didn't mention it to Pat's attorney because she was not familiar with legal procedures. This appeal document also said that Pat had psychiatric reports written about her in 1975 that portrayed her as a depressed and agitated person. And it also said she may have not been able to distinguish right from wrong at that time, but there was no evidence that she had any lack of judgment or intellect. The court denied the motion for the new trial and Pat appealed, but was again denied because the court did not feel she was insane at the time of her trial. And so Pat would have to serve her sentence. Apparently, though, Pat was a model inmate at the Georgia Women's Correctional Institute at Hardwick. She was friendly and endearing to the seasoned prison matrons. This good behavior led the prison to train Pat in caring for the elderly. And in November of 1984, after serving less than half of her sentence, Pat was released to a halfway house and paroled. What? The end. Oh my gosh. JK. We have more. She went on to do what she learned in prison, which was take care of the elderly. Believe it or not. I can't believe (laughs) this. I do not want to believe this. It's so crazy. Crazy that she was convicted of attempted murder. Two counts Double. and was able to do this and that she went on to take care of the old. I, I don't understand. I don't understand. It's, it's the craziest thing. So and then in the spring of 1987, Pat struck again. She forged a resume to obtain a job as an in-home registered nurse. Pat was never a registered nurse. She never obtained a nursing license. Right. And so she went to work as an in-home registered nurse for a prominent Atlanta couple, James and Betty Christ. James was an executive in the electric power industry, while Betty was an honors college grad who volunteered for numerous organizations. Shortly after Pat got this job, she brought her daughter Debbie on as a fellow fake registered nurse to help with James, who was rapidly declining with Parkinson's disease. Sadly, James passed away in December of 1988, but Pat and Debbie continued to take care of Betty in her home until early 1989, and then they were let go because Betty's insurance had run out. There was no more money to pay them with. Or was that just what Pat said happened? Apparently, in 1990, Debbie called her sister, Pat's other daughter Susan, who we've talked about, and accused her of being the one to call Betty Christ and tell lies about Debbie and Pat so that they would get fired. Susan told her husband about this call, and he really had enough. They both really had enough at this point of Pat's, you know, behavior. And, of course, now Debbie is partaking in this fake nursing job and everything. Right. So they're they're not having any of it. So – Susan's husband decided that he was just going to call Betty Christ himself. And that's when they found out that Pat and Debbie actually were fired because 
They basically just took control of the household and ran everything. They also found out that Pat had been drugging Betty with sleeping pills to the point that she was also almost comatose at times. Wow. It's not known if she was actually giving James sleeping pills too because at that point he had already been cremated and, you know, nobody really had suspected anything before he was cremated. So there's no way of knowing whether or not she had been drugging him as well. But the theory is that once Pat was subduing this elderly couple with sleeping pills, she began stealing from them. She was stealing physical items such as jewelry, priceless Civil War artifacts, and more. And sometimes she didn't even sell the things that she stole. For example, Susan later said that Pat stole some beautiful antique lace from the Crists and used it to make outfits for her dolls. No, Mm -mm. immediately no. (laughs) Immediately no. (laughs) No. No, I know. So attempts were made by Pat and Debbie as well to be included in the Chris will. I assume that those were unsuccessful attempts because there was no more information about that. So thank goodness they did not get into anybody else's will. Oh my gosh. So in early 1989, just a few months after James passed away, their son Jimmy started to worry about Betty's declining health. So he stopped by for a visit unannounced. He saw pills in Betty's salad and was immediately suspicious oh Oh, no way (laughs) my gosh i have so many questions i know and what is she just like so like so blase yeah that she's just like crushing up pills and putting them on top of her salad like in plain sight that is wild I didn't even read that as them being crushed up. I read them as like pine <laughs> nuts being thrown on onto them. <laughs> that is so wild. But obviously, if somebody's already been subdued and drugged, like they they truly might not notice. Who right. knows? So Jim takes Betty for a blood test secretly, and the results show that she had been completely loaded with the sleeping pill Halcyon. Jim immediately fired Pat and Debbie and goes to the police to open a case. But there isn't much to go on. The whole file for the case was just one piece of yellow paper from a legal pad that said, quote, all leads exhausted. Oh, man. Wow. (gasps) So when Susan learned about the things her mom and sister had done, she called the DA's office. And with this new information from Susan, the case was assigned to the DA investigator. Investigators Don Stoop and Michelle Berry dug deep into the Chris case as well as the Elder Allenson murder case, and in the end, they were convinced that Pat had a lot more to do with both cases than she was letting on. Finally, on April 17th, 1991, Pat and Debbie were both arrested and charged with aggravated assault with intent to murder in the case of Betty, as well as two counts of theft by taking two counts of unlawful acquisition of drugs and practicing nursing without a license. Pat, Debbie, and the rest of the family were super angry at Susan for throwing them under the bus and having them arrested. How dare you, Susan, to like try to keep people safe? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So Pat and Debbie even obtained a legal injunction to prevent Susan from ever contacting them, which I'm sure Susan's like, okay, "Okay." (laughs) great. So now that Pat was behind bars again, the DA investigators pushed for charges to be brought against her in the case of Walter and Carolyn Allenson. But the assistant DA wanted to play it safe, and instead, they offered Pat a plea deal. The deal was for her to plead guilty to all charges involving the Chris, and in exchange, she would get an eight-year sentence. How? 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 How is that even on the table for her? I don't know. They obviously wanted to um, get her on something, but like eight years? That's nothing. It's a slap in the face. So Debbie would be placed in a pretrial intervention program rather than spending time in prison. And the DA's office would never again question her about the Allenson murders. Wow. Yeah, that's a pretty sweet deal for Pat. Amazing for Pat, terrible for everyone else. The investigators are absolutely livid, and they feel like the assistant DA was letting Pat get away with a double murder. But the DA said that although they could have indicted her on charges, it was better used as a bargaining tool. On June 12, 1991, Pat pleaded guilty to all charges in the Chris case, and she was sentenced to eight years in prison. And despite her second set of convictions, Pat's parents continued to be protective of her. Meanwhile, Tom Allenson had been paroled back in 1989, and now that investigators were aware of Pat having these multiple attempted murder convictions, they wanted to go and speak to Tom. 
For the first time ever, Tom told investigators the truth about what happened the night his parents were killed. And what does he have to lose at this point? He's already served his time. He's been paroled. And Double jeopardy. Exactly. Now else. he can say anything he wants. So Tom admitted to being the one who pulled the trigger, killing both of his parents. But he said that it was, in fact, in self-defense. Tom went to his parents' house that day, hoping to talk to his mom about reconciling with the family. He chose to go over there at that time because he knew that his father was still at work and wouldn't be home for hours. When Tom arrived, nobody was home, so he went down into the basement to wait for his mom. And that might seem like a strange thing to do, but he said he hid in the basement just in case his dad came home early because, as we said before, Tom was a little paranoid and extra cautious because the last time he saw his dad, Walter, he said he would kill Tom if he saw him again, and Tom believed it. While Tom was in the basement, everyone showed up at the house, his mom, his dad, little Carolyn, and his kids. The anonymous woman who called to alert Walter that Tom was on his way over is believed to have been Pat, and she, of course, was intentionally trying to set up a confrontation between Tom and his dad by getting them both to the house at the same time. Walter took his pistol and went downstairs to look for Tom, who was hiding in the cubbyhole in the basement. Tom said that Walter fired shots at him, emptying the pistol. And so Tom backed into the cubby hole and realized that by some twist of fate, his father actually had hidden a shotgun in there. So Tom grabbed the shotgun while Walter yelled up for Carolyn to bring down the rifle. As Carolyn was making her way down the stairs with the rifle in hand, she fired a shot towards Tom, who then fired back at her instinctually, hitting her in the chest and killing her instantly. At that point, Walter made a move to grab the rifle and aimed it at Tom as he was trying to flee the house. So Tom fired the shotgun as he ran and hit his father twice. Tom then ditched the gun in the bushes as he was running from the house. He told the investigators that over time, he had come to realize how Pat was actually the one who manipulated this entire situation. It was she who had prodded him to go visit his parents after they said they didn't want to see him. She, of course, lied about Walter exposing himself to her, and she made this anonymous call to warn Walter that Tom was coming over. She pretty much orchestrated everything except for pulling the trigger. Now, before you go thinking that Tom's story sounds absolutely insane, the evidence actually backs up exactly what he said. Tom stated that his father shot at him six times and emptied the pistol. There were six bullet holes in the wall surrounding the cubby hole, and there were only six casings from the pistol found. Tom also said that his mom fired the rifle once, and he fired the shotgun twice, and the evidence confirmed those statements as well. In the end, authorities believed Tom's story. They already thought Pat had more of a role, but they weren't exactly sure what she had done. But now it was obvious that she was the mastermind. It just didn't end up the way she hoped. Ann Rule actually wrote an extensive book about this case and presented a theory that Pat set up the murder of the Allensons in hope that Tom would also be killed in the gunfire. With Tom gone, Pat could move on and find a husband who actually had access to money. You know, I actually can get behind that theory that she was actually hoping Tom would have been the one to get shot. Absolutely. Like, if he's going over there, his dad's... His dad knows because she calls his dad. His dad goes over there fiery mad, and it's just a shootout. Yeah. Of course, that's what she thinks would happen. If Tom hadn't found that shotgun, that's what would have happened. Right. So after Tom is paroled, he marries his childhood friend named Liz and becomes a born-again Christian, which he said ended up helping him come to terms with murdering his parents and in forgiving Pat. Anne Rule's book, Everything She Ever Wanted, was released in 1993. Anne actually spent over a month in Atlanta conducting interviews and spent more than a year researching and writing the book. Even still, Pat's mom says the book is full of untruths, specifically regarding her. Pat was not interviewed about the book because, according to her mom, she was too sick to talk, paralyzed from two strokes and bound to a wheelchair. Tom, on the other hand, loved the book and he praised Anne's work. Tom found the book incredibly accurate and said the book even helped him see things more clearly. Tom said he really just wanted to make Pat happy, but nothing made her happy. It took him a while to really see the truth. And Tom said, quote, I did a lot of stupid things, but that was because I was so blindly in love, end quote. 
Pat was released from prison in 1999 after serving her eight years. Unbelievable. Totally. She went to live with her stepfather upon release and opened a doll shop called Pat's Pretty Playthings. I wonder if she sold the dolls with the antique lace. (laughs) If not, then what was it for? I I mean, come on. (laughs) So we're really not sure what she's been up to for the last 20 years, but even as she's continued to age, she's continued to find trouble. So in March of 2008, 70-year-old Pat was charged with three felony counts of unauthorized distribution of controlled substances. She had gone around doctor shopping and she got hydrocodone prescriptions. In one year, she was able to obtain 3,700 pills. Wow. Yeah. Officers said they would normally investigate someone for distribution with numbers like that. But sadly, it appeared that Pat was actually using them all herself. She was able to fool a lot of doctors with her sweet little old lady act. Pat's daughter Susan told American Justice that the thing you should take away from this case is that, quote, you don't have to look bad to be bad, end quote. Pat really looked and acted like the Southern Belle, but she wasn't one at all. Susan said, quote, crazy is not what she is. I feel like she's just cold, very cold, calculating, end quote. Wow. This whole story is so, I don't even know. I don't even have it words. It just keeps going and going and just. It just keeps going and, just... and going. And obviously, Tom absolutely should have served his sentence for his involvement in the murder, for shooting right. his parents. Of course, he murdered them and he, you know, had deserved to pay the price for that. But also thinking about him and like, man, you know, this woman comes into your life and you think that this is somebody that you want to be with and that you, you know, you like this person enough to get married to them, even though you know it's going to cause a problem with your family. And then over the course of this woman being in your life, your parents are dead, your grandparents are dead. Like that is just mind blowing to me that she like completely just decimated an entire family. Like two generations. Yeah. Well, three because Tom as well. And who knows what that does to, you know, his kids. And he kids has and, kids. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's so much. Yeah. Oh, I want to check out that book, though. That sounds really good. Yeah, for sure. All right, Melissa. So before we get out of here for the week, we're going to do our, we're going to turn the page and do our last thing before we go, which if you've listened to the show for a while, you know that that's just the end of the show where we kind of do a little palate cleanser and talk about something silly and it's always something different. So um, this week I'm super excited because as you guys know, it's very rare that Melissa and I will watch the same TV show, especially if it's a reality TV show. Yeah. (laughs) But We have been watching the same show. So Love is Blind. What is it? Season three? I think we're on season three. Season three. Yes. So I, Melissa got me turned on to Love is Blind in the first season and I watched the second season and then I, believe it or not, was the first one to realize that season three was out and I text Melissa and I was like, hey, Love is Blind is on and she was like, oh my gosh, is it new people or like what's going on? I was like, yeah, it's a whole new season. So we started watching it and now we're going to talk about Love is Blind. We are. And let us know if you're inter- interested in this because <laughs> We're they're gonna like <laughs> releasing episodes. Yeah. <laughs> they're releasing a few episodes every week. We can do little recaps, whatever. So today we were just going to kind of talk about who the couples are, I think, and a little bit of our thoughts on them. Does yes. that sound like a good way to start it? That sounds great. Yeah. And you watched the show more recently than I did. You were just watching it in the last couple of days. So um, you yeah. can go ahead and start off if you want to steer the conversation. Great. <laughs> I had to get Netflix again. I had literally gotten the email that said, oh, we're sorry to see you go because I canceled my Netflix. And then Mandy <laughs> told me and I'm like, dang it, they got me back. <laughs> so I'm back on it. So let's just go into who we have as a couple. So let's start with um, Alexa and uh, Brennan. Alexa and Brennan. Alexa is an insurance agency owner. She is beautiful. She is loud. She is fun. Okay, I beautiful. love Alexa. My gosh, love I love her. Alexa yeah. because her attitude is just kind of like mine, basically, where she's like, this is how I am and this is how I like to live my life and I just don't really care. You know, she's talked about her family on the yeah. show and how like everyone in her family is like that. They're all very just like say whatever they want. And like I love family. My family is a lot like that as well. Like my mom's side of the family is very much – no filter, like just very, yeah, yeah. like we all kind of just the jokes that we make and everything. I think some families probably would like look a little sideways at us, but um, Alexa is like that too. And so, yeah, she's awesome. I think actually as a couple, they might not be too bad off. I think she's a really strong personality, but he is not that strong of a personality. So I feel He's like that goes not. together. 
So he's a water treatment engineer slash sales coach and entrepreneur, apparently. He comes in with a cowboy hat, which immediately I was like, I'm writing him off. Right. But he comes across <laughs> actually as very kind, funny. He's like very like uh, – will let her dominate a conversation, not dominate, but like be in charge of the conversation and he comes in, but like he appears to like that role. Yes. It's one thing for somebody to just be like, you're the alpha and I'm the quieter one, but he just seems to be like, yeah, no, that's fine. I like this. This is, I'm, I'm a good number two person. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I think they're like, okay. I, I did okay. text Mandy okay this match. and I said, I hate everyone on this season, but it was mostly as I went through, I'm like, they're, they're fine. They could, I could see them going either way. That's what we should do. We should take predictions. Okay. So on record, Mandy, will Brennan and Alexa get married? I think that they will. On decision day. I think they will get married. I don't know okay. if they will last though, because I do feel like in some of the conversations when she has kind of been opening up more about like her family and the way that um, she wants to uh, raise her own raise children, her kids, right? Yeah. Sometimes I feel like he's like, okay, well, like maybe we'll have to talk about that. So I do wonder if when the time comes for more serious conversations, if he's going to realize that like maybe she's not exactly what he's looking for. So I don't know. I think they will get married though. Okay. I like that. Who do you want to talk about next? So let's talk about um, the flight attendant. What is her name? What's Zeneb? her name? Zeneb, yes. And who is she with? Uh, Cole. Cole. That's right. He's a realtor. Okay. So I got to say, I love Cole. I think he's one of my favorite guys on this season just because he's a very fun, loving, like very happy-go-lucky kind of guy, which also isn't always the greatest thing in a relationship. Um I don't think that this is a good match for a couple because she is way too um I don't know, she's, she's way She's been through a lot. She's she, she lost her parents at a very young she age. She did. Yeah. I she's think, very yeah, structured she's though and very like she likes things her way and I feel like she, she is not laid back at all and I feel like Cole is super laid back. So I don't think those two are going to make it personally. No, I would agree with you. I hope they don't because I actually think that they are both decent people, but I think they are matched horribly For and sure. it's just but you know what his last name is barnett and he gives me barnett vibes like he just does. too much I, too, <laughs> like i couldn't be in a room with him for more than a few minutes I, I would think he was a lot of fun and maybe want to be friends with him but i could not be in a relationship with somebody that's that big of a personality all like he seems like he's always on and like sometimes like shut up well <laughs> yeah and, and then up. i think where they're gonna get into an issue is because she seems like she is she seems like she's really good at having serious conversations and like yes. being and he doesn't seem like he is great at taking everything seriously i don't know i'm not saying that he can't be serious but like from what i've seen i feel like he's the kind of person who leans more into like joking about things and sure and that's fine if the person that you're dealing with is also okay with that kind of thing but like so people who aren't like that will get very very mad at you if you try to deal with something yeah with humor and that's not the way that they process and deal with things and i definitely don't think she is she seems a little too sensitive to like i don't know I, I guess yeah, we'll, well see. they were like day one of them being together. It was very uh, them like already having like passive aggressive arguments. Right. I was like, this isn't good at yeah. all. This is literally the honeymoon phase. This right. is 24 hours <laughs> this in. This is better than the honeymoon phase. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Okay. How about SK and Raven next? <laughs> so Raven, I can't stand Raven. I don't think I'm the only <gasps> one who no, I'm just kidding. feels that way. Um, she's really full of herself, but like in a really bad way. Like, and she is a very beautiful woman, and I think that she has a lot going for her. She seems like she like loves her life and likes the things that she does and loves her job. And I think those are all wonderful things. But there was a point like when she was in the pods and she was literally doing jumping jacks while she was having like serious conversations with people. She's in there like working out. And so I'm like, okay, are you really that like superficial or like you just like really don't care what this person is saying? Like I just found it so rude to see her doing that and like the way that she was always kind of blowing off people. And I don't think that she's really into SK at all. I think he she, seems really nice. He I thought seems he was, really nice. Yeah. And he's like really being patient with her and wanting to like take it slow. He's like, oh, okay, you know, like I understand, you know, because she she keeps telling him all that crap about like wanting to just let the 
attraction build, which basically is saying like there is nothing there. I'm not attracted <laughs> to you. Which right. she's a fool. He is very, very good looking. Um, he's a data engineer, but just he's got like more of a calm presence. But she has to me more of like I'm bored with everything presence. Like yes. none of this is good enough for me. And that is going to get old very fast. And I would like to compliment you here because you're a big fitness person and you I would not see you doing this. Like no. <laughs> you are not in your face with people. Like whatever you're doing, like you're doing it, but it's not like everyone else's journey. She makes it everyone's journey. And that's that's her whole personality is yeah. doing that. And it's it doesn't it you know, we see editing and I know how reality so shows work to a certain extent. Like they pick their bad guys and, you know, show that kind of stuff. But sure. it does make you feel like, ooh, I, I really like him, but her together, I don't think it's a great match. Yeah, no, I, I, I honestly will be shocked if they actually get married. I think it's going to be him that says no. Oh, good point. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I, I'm going to go, you know what? Actually, no, I'm going to say that they're going to get married because I feel like early on, sometimes they do this to trick you. So this is the one I'm going to go opposite of you on. I'm going to say they are going to get married and somehow they'll have a connection later on. I'm going to be wrong, but I'm okay right. with that. All right. Okay, so who, there's somebody else on the show, Melissa, there's that, two more. that you oh, said okay. had a whole personality out of their hobby. So who was that? <laughs> oh, um, would that be Colleen? Hi, I'm a ballerina. That would be um, Colleen. Hi, I'm yes. a ballerina. <laughs> I'm a ballerina. And the poor girl, she just got like a bad edit. I saw a TikTok of her and she was, it was that one that's like, it's cool when I'm doing it, it's a problem. Or it's a, it's cool when they do it, it's a problem when I do it. And it was like her saying that she was a ballerina a million times. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but it was the editing, but you're like, oh my gosh, girl, it's okay. She's like, everybody wants to talk to ballerinas because we're so interesting. I'm like, I don't think that's why their dudes are wanting to talk right. to you. I have to be honest. <laughs> I have to be honest. So she is paired up. She ends up, okay, poor girl. Poor girl. She like falls for two different guys who reject her and we know this happens a lot on the show like they'll like afterwards you hear like well i did have feelings for this person or this person they're not going to show you everything so she was shown with like two different guys being like he could be the one and then him being like honestly i'm kind of interested in this yeah. other girl <laughs> so she ends up pairing up or being engaged to matt bolton who is a private charter sales executive who I feel like is very much the last girl at the dance. Like, I don't think they're match very well. It's just kind of you like you're the last one here. <gasps> See, I think he is I, a bore. No way. I I feel totally opposite of that. I feel like Wild. I do think it's kind of unfortunate and a little crazy that he was like her third pick, basically. So that kind of stinks for her. Does he know that? I don't know. I don't know. But – I will say that they are my favorite couple. I think that they <gasps> are actually really good together. And I think they will be a good match with each other. They're my favorites for sure. I, his personality, <laughs> Mandy, I, I just can't, mm -mm, no. And well, everything he says, he's tea, like, Melissa, that's okay. <laughs> he's not my cup of tea, Diet Coke, coffee, <laughs> Listerine, just nothing. I don't want anything to do with him. I'm sure he's a nice person. I'm not saying that right. But he's one of those people that has to say like the F word for everything. He's like, you're effing this, you're effing this, you're effing. I'm like, okay, can we just any more adjectives? I still can't do winner <laughs> whenever, but I have a few more adjectives in my repertoire. So it's just like, I'm like, okay, but I just, I'm not feeling it. But I'm excited that you think they're great. I, I hope they get married to take me out of my misery and the two of them can just be happy forever. I don't care. <laughs> um, I, I don't think they're going to get married because I think she's looking for more excitement than he is. And he is a bore. <laughs> Did I get that right? I think so. Okay, Mandy. Last couple, and then we have like one honorable mention, I think. So um, the last couple is Bartise and Nancy. And Bartise is a senior analyst. Uh, he's younger than Nancy by what, like five or six years? Yeah. She and she is very hung up on that. Something. She is very hung up on their age difference. But can I be honest? Anybody that says, I'm so mature for my age, and everybody's like, dude, it doesn't even matter. You're like, what age are you? Who cares? You're like, so cool. I wish oh, no, you were I my will, guy. I wish oh, I could yeah. marry him. Uh -uh. No, I will no. definitely go on the record and say that if a 25, if I was her age, what she, was she, 34, and it was a 25 year old man, I probably also would be a little apprehensive about that. I don't think I would give the time of day to a 25 year old. No, nor should you. No. Um, just, I mean, 
whatever works for people, whatever works. But this coupling, I don't think works. Mm, I think they. I don't either. Mm-hmm. I think he wants something better. And he does. And she's great. Right. And and speaking of what he wants better, like he also had like a little fling with Raven, who we said was the fitness addict who yeah, does yeah. jumping jacks while having serious conversations. Um, it was actually with Bartise that she was doing that. But they had like a connection in the pods. And um, after the fact, like when they all they had like a little, you know, cocktail hour where they all got to meet each other and see each other for the first time since they got coupled up. And all Bartiz could talk about was how hot he thought Raven was. Like, that's all he to said. To Nancy. Like, yes. And and saying, exactly, saying it to Nancy about, like, how good looking Raven was and how, like, that's the kind of girl that he normally would go for, like, in the real world. I'm like, why are you saying this to the person that, like, you chose as your, like, you Where know? it made me livid is when he said to her, does it bother you that I'm being so honest with you? Yes, like, no, it does. actually, you're just being rude. It's like, rude. Yeah. No. Yeah. And they had one point where he was just talking to like the camera like it was just a single shot of him talking and he was I mean he he was literally like foaming like drooling at the mouth like talking about Raven and he was like oh and she's got a great body and she had that tight dress on and like talking about how he was like checking her out at the cocktail party and everything and um but both of them and like honestly I liked Bartise kind of in the Mm -hmm. first episode or two but then like by the end of the third episode I was like no, Try you're hard. just – he's just as bad as Raven to me. I wish they would have gotten paired up together because I feel like there would have been so much good drama if they had been, like, living together. Oh, yeah. I thought you were going to say, if like, they were going to be a good couple. I'm like, no, 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 no. No, they would they be a would, terrible couple. <laughs> mm-hmm, horrific. I love it. So, Mandy, we have to give – okay, so you think, yes, they will get married. No, they will not get married. I do not think that they are going to get married. Yeah, I don't either. I could honestly see no one getting married this season, if I'm being perfectly yeah. honest. Somebody yeah. will, though. Honorable mention goes to Andrew Liu. He is a wildlife photographer. (laughs) He's traveled everywhere. He does everything. He's so great. He's wonderful. You're lucky to be in a room with him even thinking about him, Mandy. He, (laughs) at one point, is kind of paired up with Nancy. It seems like they have a thing. But Mandy, explain to us what happens when Nancy says this isn't going to work and Andrew's going home. Oh, I forget what happened. Did I miss Mandy, that? Mandy, here's what happened. You didn't forget this part. He is getting like his exit interview with Netflix or oh. whatever, <laughs> the producers. And he takes out a bottle of like Visine or whatever, squirts it in his eyes and starts talking. He goes, can I, are you guys rolling? They're like, yeah. So he squirts tears in his eyes. He's like, is it okay then- if I do this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the producer's like, yeah, if your eyes are bothering you, go ahead. And then he says something stupid and then he does it again. He doubles up on his tears and looks into the camera and he's like, I just really never thought a girl would ever make me cry. <laughs> and you know he thought they were going to edit around that and they didn't. And that is why Hilarious. they are amazing. Hilarious. Yes. So good. Yeah. So he was, when he was in the pods, like he wasted no time letting people know like exactly what he he was into um into which is himself which is himself oh yeah. that too yeah but he oh. also like went like honestly i told melissa i was like i feel like i was just assaulted through the tv like some of the stuff this guy was talking about like i was like wow this is not pod conversation this is like face this to is face. not pod appropriate face to face conversation and because then like what if you're saying all these weird things to like these like sexual things to someone and then like you meet them and you're like oh i wish i didn't say that to you <laughs> it was so i mean it is I guess we should back up and say if you've ever seen the show, these people have never seen each other in their lives. And then they get engaged at the end. And honestly, chaos ensues. (laughs) But but yeah, it was so like I was so uncomfortable watching him talk about these things. And I was like, Netflix, aren't you going to put a new rating on this episode or something? Because (laughs) something's going on here. So yeah, it was I'm not sad to see him go. But I I know we see him again because, you know, they always bring people back for drama, which thank you. I appreciate. I'm here for all of that. But so far, I just think it's kind of, it's not the most exciting season yet. But, yeah, it's um, not the most exciting. But I still think I'm into it. I'm still, I'm still I am too. It. Oh, I'm still going to watch it. <laughs> I think the next episode is November 2nd, maybe? Or I don't know. I think it there's might be some sooner. coming out tomorrow, the 26th. Oh, that's what yeah. it is. Yes, 26th. So catch up and then we will report back next week um, yes. if you guys enjoy this. And even if you don't, we're, we're doing probably anyway. still will yeah. because we have... <laughs> We have a few last thing before we go to to go for the year. So 
Um, anyway, before we go, though, we are going to be playing a promo from our friends, Dr. Scott and Dr. Shiloh. They are with LA Not So Confidential, which I love that podcast name and the podcast. They actually know what they're doing. Their show is funny. Like and yeah. <laughs> you, yeah, like you can listen to them, but don't leave us because right. <laughs> clearly they're more qualified, but they'll even break down like uh, new documentaries and stuff like and coming at it from their psychology and pop culture and just it's a really fun show so you should definitely check it out awesome all right guys that is it for this week we will be back next week same time same place new story have a great week bye settle in for an evening of mystery mayhem and exploration of the dark side of humanity i'm dr shiloh a former cop and i'm dr scott a former Hollywood casting director. Now we're both forensic psychologists working in Southern California. Are you fascinated by the twisted minds that commit criminal acts? Do you ever wonder how could they do that? In each episode of our podcast, LA Not So Confidential, we dissect the nexus where true crime, forensic psychology, and entertainment meet. Dee Blanchard was exaggerating her daughter's medical condition for financial gain. We serve up fascinating cases viewed through the lens of human behavior. Brother, why is your brother afraid of you? Delivered with our signature gallows humor while examining the actual diagnoses and dishing on the media portrayal. The kids are alive. Subscribe to LA Not So Confidential anywhere you go for podcasts. Come and join us for LA Not So Confidential. Trust us, we're doctors. Thanks so much for listening to the Moms and Murder podcast. Make sure to check back with us next week for a new episode. You can also find us at momsandmurder.com where you can connect with us via social media. Please make sure you subscribe and give us five stars because giving us four stars would be a crime. Thanks so much.